Thank you so much, Brian. It's uh, really because of Brian that I'm here, and uh, I thank you for your kind words. I feel very comfortable here, and it's not just because I think that this may be uh, still one of the few places on earth where my Philadelphia accent will sound natural to some of, to some of you. Uh, but more than that, I remember that this is a museum of uh, anthropology and archaeology. Is it still so named? Indeed, it is. Uh, and the archaeology aspect. Now, of course, uh, I stunned our friend here by uh, showing him that all of his efforts to uh, provide me with slide support is going to be uh, wasted uh, because I'm going to be uh, speaking as an uh, economic historian and we don't have much in the way of, uh, of slides. But archaeology, I remember, is the opening section of Thucydides' great history, the Archaeologia. And some of you may remember that Thucydides goes out of his way to make clear that the ancient Greeks really were not very knowledgeable about their ancient history. And then he goes on at 120 to say something remarkable, that they're also not very knowledgeable about Takai Noon, the things that are happening contemporaneously. And he gives a few examples. For example, all the Greeks think that there is no military machine like the great Pitonates Lochos, the Pitonates Brigade in Sparta. But Thucydides says there never was any such thing. And people think, he says, that each Spar each of the two Spartan kings has two votes. Uh, no, they have two kings, but each king has one vote uh, when decisions are made. And then the Athenians believe that the great patriot, patriots, Armodius and Aristogiton, killed Hipparchus, who was the tyrant of Athens, but Thucydides points out that that never was the case. So the ancient Athenians might have had assumptions and presumptions that, and factual knowledge that just wasn't true. We're probably no better. And uh, one of the things I'm going to try to do in my presentation is to pick up on Thucydides. And before I get into the lessons we can learn from antiquity, that is from ancient Greece, I want to deal with some conceptions of Takai Noon, what's going on right now. So, for example, one thesis that I state whenever I speak on the Euro crisis, which is the crisis I'm dealing with, uh, that I always point out, except when they invited me to uh, the University of Berlin, having heard of my uh, quaint ideas that they could learn from antiquity, I left out this point, which uh, underlines my, uh, my presentation, and it's that Mistakes of judgment, you'll, you'll see on uh, handout sheet number one, Thucydides 2.13, that Thucydides uh, says in a different context that the success of a democratic state, or he thinks of any state, depends on two principal factors, <coughs> economy, the decisions they make, and periousia rematum, their financial condition, make sure they have an excess of cash. Uh, well, there's this country, Germany, uh, which uh, made a colossal error, in my opinion, uh, in Genomi, when about 15 years ago, they de-emphasized the study of classical literature because they wanted something more practical. But I think the suicidal and destructive decisions that they've been making in dealing with the Euro crisis reflects the fact that they no longer have knowledge of how the Athenians would have handled things. And so that's why I say it was a destructive decision. And in Germany, I left out that part when I spoke. <laughs> but I did offer them these lessons uh, from ancient Athenian uh, history. And I hope they don't conclude that they can bring in a guest lecturer now and then, and that will make up for 10 years of studying ancient Greek. Uh, it probably won't. Uh, but we're probably uh, no better off uh, when it comes to our knowledge than uh, the Athenians were. For example, there seems to be a general view uh, that while Athens was fantastic, obviously, had so many elements of the high culture of the Western world, philosophy, 
literature, art, you name it, dramatics. Uh, they invented many of these things and brought them to heights that were never seen again. But the general view seems to be among learned people and even among classicists that it's Rome that has the law, construction, finance on a high scale. Athens might have had the philosophy of law, but nothing practical. So I want to introduce this underlying idea. Remember, or let, let me tell you, the Athenians invented the world's first private banks. And after a lifetime of studying uh, the literature, the ancient literature on these banks, which are unusually well represented in our surviving orations, uh, in my opinion, and after a lifetime spent uh, to a large extent in American banking also, uh, my judgment is that the Athenians operated their banks with a skill seldom equaled, probably never surpassed, and that we have a lot to learn from them. So that's an underlying thought. And for those of you who may not have known that the Athenians even had banks, uh, bear that in mind. Uh, don't believe in the Pitanates brigade ever, and don't believe that the Athenians did not have banks. The second thing that I'd invite you not to believe is the generally prevailing view that the modern Greeks are a bunch of lazy louts who just don't want to pay taxes. Now, I know that we've seen spectacular pictures of all the uh, swimming pools uh, in Attica and the fact that only seven people from the 1,400 pools that have been identified that only seven people reported they had pools and paid taxes on them. And it wasn't reported that of the seven, five were American, two were, two were Europeans. So maybe no Greeks did. But on the, on the handout sheet, the last page, uh, you'll see a little chart uh, that I picked up from that eminent uh, statistical group, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is based in uh, the Chateau uh, de la Muette in Paris, and prepare statistics uh, each year. And I gave it to you back in 2000, so you can see that this is not something generated in expectation of uh, political controversy. Of all the developed countries which are listed here, the veracity of the report, you can confirm for yourselves by the obvious fact that Americans are reported as working much longer hours than the French. But I wish I could astound you by saying that the Greeks are the hardest working uh, people in all the developed countries. I can't because there's one country which, according to this statistical study, uh, works harder than Greece, and that's not surprisingly South Korea, if I promulgated this uh, correctly and remember it correctly. Chile. Two? Chile. 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 Well, the Greeks are, the Greeks are up there. Uh, my recollection is that I can't say that the Germans are the least hardworking because uh, they're only the second least hardest working in terms of the average number of hours worked. Uh, their former compatriots, the Dutch, were right with the Germans, uh, impressing upon Greece the need for austerity, the need to work hard as though they were Northern Europeans. Uh, but in the meantime, the Dutch seem to be, correct me if I misremember this, the Dutch seem to be the least hardworking terms of average number of hours, but the Germans are second. So the presumptions we make about things that are going on today are not necessarily true, and I think that's something which uh, underlies this. Now take tax evasion. Uh, there's the Tax Justice Network, which is a uh, group dedicated to eradicating tax evasion, I suppose, by the wealthy people in the United States. Uh, they're all over the internet and they do all kinds of uh, studies. And their studies show that the outstanding, uh, the world leader in tax evasion is the United States of America on an absolute basis. Uh, the Tax Justice Network uh, has uh, projected or theorized that American uh, tax evasion is at about $350 billion a year. Other groups range American tax evasion as anywhere from $250 billion to a trillion dollars a year. Uh, Greece, of course, uh, is such a small country, it can't hope to compete with the United States in total evasion. But even Germany, 
can't quite catch up in total evasion with the United States, but they do their best. The same tax justice network uh, projects that the average German per capita is able to evade two and a half times as much taxes as are evaded in the United States. So Greece certainly has competition in the field of not paying taxes. However, bear in mind that most of the Greek taxes come from what is probably Europe's highest now and previously one of the highest value-added sales taxes, which gets collected. So I wish I could give you more information uh, on exactly how the world goes on tax evasion, but the problem is in the modern world, we really don't have statistical evidence on illicit activities. In the ancient world, we have no surviving statistics at all. Uh, we have impressions, we have lots of numbers, but a study such as the OECD study just wasn't done to our knowledge anywhere in antiquity. It doesn't mean that information from antiquity is worthless. So for example, a lot of discussion going on as to precisely how much trafficking in sexual workers is going on worldwide. But because it's illicit, and for other reasons, we just don't have statistical information. At Athens, where the Pornicon tell us the prostitutional tax, ancient Athens that is, uh, was a major factor in their, uh, not a major factor, but was a factor in their uh, tax collection, uh, we're told that the taxes when they were farmed, that is leased out to private collectors, along with the when exact knowledge of which people were engaged in this uh, business practice. So I'm just suggesting that the absence of statistics in the ancient world should not be overplayed in terms of our not being able to reach economic conclusions, because in the modern world, our statistical situation is very uncertain. Uh, the Fed is always complaining that by the time the federal member banks and other uh, study groups gather the information, it takes four months. The problems are new. They're always behind. And you probably have seen uh, the fourth quarter. The whole world was shocked that the American economy contracted. Wait two months. And we learned, well, it didn't really contract. It actually expanded. But it did not expand very much. Wait another three months. When it is completely irrelevant, we'll probably find, we may find, that it expanded sharply. Uh, statistics are a real problem today. Uh, their absence is a problem from antiquity, but in many ways the world is similar. So now, what are these lessons uh, that I had the audacity to uh, be offering the Germans uh, from an inferior civilization that they no longer uh, deem worthy of uh, serious study, at least on the high school gymnasium level, uh, in the ancient Athenian? Let me summarize for you, lest in my discursive fashion you may lose track of uh, of what I'm trying to get across. But basically, uh, I've selected four principal lessons that I think we can learn uh, from ancient Athens. We being the European Union, the OECD, President Obama, uh, whoever, but I don't see any of them present here, so you'll, I'll have to depend on you to uh, spread the word. The first lesson is this, that pistis, confidence, and bistocini is the uh, modern Greek word. We just don't seem to have a word in English that really covers the je ne sais quoi, that in ineluctable element that <coughs> means that one day Lehman Brothers can borrow untold billions of dollars without question. The next day, they could not even borrow enough to make payroll. It's an element. Demosthenes said that peace thesis a forme esti pason e megiste pros ton primatismon, that a sense of confidence, reliability, is the most important element for capital formation in money markets. Uh, and that's on, our, that's on our handout sheet, I think, item number uh, three, for those of you who want to check the Greek. But it really is an important element. The ancient Greeks, as I'll make clear, really understood whatever punishment you want for bankers, whatever you want to do in the commercial world, 
you cannot destroy the sense of confidence that people have in a country's ability to borrow in financial institutions. And as you probably know from the newspapers, the European Union, led by the authorities in Berlin, have gone to great difficulty to destroy, at least for Greece and for some of the other countries, any sense of confidence or peace. So I'll come back to that. The second element is bank, tropeza in ancient and in modern Greek. Uh, what is it? We tend to think, if you read newspapers and uh, see what's going on, that banking is like a way in which people can earn huge bonuses. It's a way in which government financial policy, perhaps, it's a way in which we uh, can equalize income. It seems to be seldom that we share Demosthenes' definition at 36.11, that a bank is an ergasia, a working operating business, pros odus echusa epikindinux apochrematon alotrion. A bank is a business that produces profit from dangerous revenues. It's highly risky, making use of other people's money. We lose track of that in all the elements that are discussed, that basically you're dealing here with a business and an extremely inherently risky business, and one should never lose track of that. For the, for the Athenians, banking was a techne. It was a learned profession. It had standards. It had skills. There was a proper way to do it. The bonuses might come later. The profits might come later. But the sense of potential destruction was always ever present. So that's the second thing that I'll be talking about, the inherent riskiness of financial institutions and non-bank financial institutions. Third of all, we learned from Athens that a skillful democratic government can collect taxes, even from a skillful populace determined not to pay taxes. And uh, that's something that Thucydides spoke of at 2.13, which is handout item number one. That, as I said, the key elements are financial strength and judgment in a state going well. Uh, Thucydides also says in the same passage another important element. You, a government should not borrow money. And if it's forced to borrow money, it should make absolutely certain that it pays back at least as much as it borrows. So uh, I know I haven't offended uh, anybody from the Tea Party hearing that, uh, but I'm actually quoting Thucydides. And that's another element that, uh, that I think many people would agree with. But those were four principal lessons that I think we can extract from, uh, uh, from the Athenian banking situation. Crisis. Uh, we're in a crisis now. I think uh, most people uh, see that, and we've been in one since uh, when? 2007, 2008. Sort of confirms Karl Marx's view that capitalism inherently is crisis prone. And any of you who want to see an updated version of uh, that Marxist uh, thesis, uh, I recommend uh, Maddox, Professor Maddox's book uh, to you, Economic Crisis and Crisis Theory which was published in 1981. So we know that capitalism is crisis prone. Uh, we also should know that Greece, modern and ancient, is crisis prone. Might suggest, <coughs> which I believe, that ancient Greece was uh, capitalistic. Uh, Max Weber makes the point that definitions of capitalism are highly impressionistic, but that if capitalism be seen as a means of uh, earning income from financial assets and not from work, then Max Weber uh, saw capitalism present in many ancient societies, China, India, Babylonia, and Greece. But there's no doubt that modern Greece is uh, crisis-driven. Uh, the economy <coughs> almost collapsed in 1884, and with nice uh, concentricity in 1983, Greece has had financial crises uh, threatening the banking system in 1931, in 1991, 2009, ongoing crisis, uh, and of course in 1933, 
Uh, Greece was one of the few countries that actually defaulted on its sovereign debt. In fact, uh, Carmen uh, Reinhardt, who with uh, Professor Rogoff from Harvard, has written a number of academic books which actually have sold. Some of you may have seen uh, This Time is Different, which uh, they published last year. But in her book, uh, From Financial Crash to Debt Crisis, published in 2010, she notes that Greece has been essentially bankrupt for at least half of the entire period since its independence in 1821. Uh, the ancient Greeks uh, seem to uh, have learned from the modern Greeks, or maybe it's vice versa, because uh, uh, Bogert, in his book, uh, Banque, Banquier, uh, Don, Lacy, Te, Grec, uh, makes the point that he believes in 376, as a result of the Spartan blockade of the uh, Bosporus, that there was a general financial crisis which brought down almost all the Athenian banks. Uh, it was lifted uh, by Habrius' uh, great victory at the naval battle of Noxos uh, late in that year. Uh, there's no doubt that there something was going on that was a big problem uh, in Greece around that period. We know from uh, passages in Demosthenes uh, 36, 50 to 51, that he enumerates uh, a number of specific banks that collapsed the bank of Socinimus. This was a bank that uh, specialized in uh, consumer credit, apparently. We have a, a fragment from Lysias, uh, which in the carry edition is 38B, where we learn that uh, that bank was able to collect 36% uh, tacos, we'll call it interest for the moment, uh, yield. Uh, on loans which uh, were so bad, uh, read the fragment, you'll see uh, the kind of loan that they made to somebody called Socrates, not the uh, philosopher. The loan was so bad that I think even an American bank would not have made that kind of loan. Uh, but so Sinemis got his come up and so his bank uh, collapsed. Uh, the bank of Aristolochus, uh, we know, specialized in real estate. You may be surprised to know that there were real estate loans or that even that there was a real estate market. But read uh, Xenophon's Oikonomikos, for example, uh, chapter 20, sub, sub paragraphs 22 to 29, uh, where uh, Isomachus, uh, discussing things with Socrates, uh, points out that his father, see, the idea is that agriculture uh, for the aristocracy in Athens was, a, was an acceptable profession. And Islamicus is pointing out that his father just loved farming. He loved it so much that he scoured Attica for farms that were not productive. And then he came in and did what modern real estate developers would call cosmetic changes, planted crops, put a lot of fertilizer in, and sold them. He loved it so much that he went back and he looked for more farms. And he found those farms and he sold them. Now, we understand that this is flipping. We understand that all too well from our own economic collapse, and uh, Socrates, this is Xenophon Socrates, Pezzi teases, plays with him, and says, why, well, you should be very proud of your father. He loved agriculture and farming the way merchants uh, love grain. That is, the merchants find out where grain is available cheaply. They love it so much, they then go and find out where, where they really need grain, and they sell it at the highest possible price. It's just wonderful the way your father loved agriculture and flipped real estate in the way these grain merchants love grain, but they don't eat it. Uh, and the uh, says, well, you're just kidding me, you're pezzy. Uh, but in any case, Aristolochus uh, apparently financed a lot of this through his bank, and uh, there were large swaths of downtown Attica, apparently Athens, uh, which formerly belonged to the bank of Aristolochus, but as of the time that Demosthenes 36 was being written, uh, the bank had collapsed, and now the creditors, too much leverage, now own the bank. So a number of banks, in fact, uh, Demosthenes says, all the other banks uh, collapsed at that time. Uh, we also know <coughs> from a scandal that affected the Parthenon, uh, an attempt by uh, the treasurers of Athena to burn down uh, the Parthenon, which is uh, told to us in a uh, scolion, a uh, ancient scholarly note to uh, Demosthenes 24, the speech against Timocrates. Uh, bankers came along and explained 
the treasure is looking. All this silver that's been gathered for Athena, it sits on top of uh, this table mountain you have in the back of the Parthenon. Nobody's earning any money from it. Why don't you give it to us? We'll pay you interest, and you shouldn't pass it on to the state because uh, the state's not getting anything now. The treasurers of Athena went ahead and did that. But when the time came to get it back, the bankers had said, when you need it, just let us know. So we know two things. Bankers paid, deposit, paid interest, and bankers understood demand deposit. When you demand it, ask for it back. The only problem was when they asked for it back, uh, the bankers explained, we don't have it, we're insolvent. Uh, no problem for the treasures of Athena. Some of you may know the famous passage. They decided to burn the Parthenon down. Hmm. Now look at the intelligence. Here's a location that even today is visible from most sites in central Athens. In those days, without the tall buildings that have risen in Athens, it must have been visible at all times. You start a fire up there, <coughs> uh, people are going to come and put it out very quickly. So the whole thing unraveled. Uh, but we know that banks in general fell like droves. Not all of them, however. There was one bank, the most famous in Athens, the bank uh, that we associate with the great Posseum, probably had assets on purchasing power parity basis in excess of $100 million, which I used to give the example was larger than the bank in Cyprus. But that was true until the Russians came. And as you know, some of you may know from the newspapers, uh, Cyprus uh, got bloated in its banking assets. But it's a Greek, uh, essentially Greek area, so naturally the banks are all now in grave danger. Athenian modern Greek banks are in terrible trouble. Uh, it's been estimated the other day that it would take $40 billion to bail the Greek banks out. Uh, our TARP funds the whole United States, which has an economy perhaps 100 times the size of Greece. Uh, this uh, tremendous infusion of great governmental uh, monies, which uh, one of our parties objects to strenuously, TARP came to $250 billion in all, of which only about $100 billion really went to aid struggling banks in the United States. The other 150, they forced good banks to take so that nobody would know which was the troubled bank. Beasties. You don't upset the public or anyone else's confidence in a bank. Uh, this is a tribute to American classical studies that the Fed knew this, uh, or, perhaps, uh, or perhaps they were able to intuit it on their own. So that's a little background of the nature of Athenian banks. I might just quickly tell you that, of course, they were professional. That's why they had, were termed again and again at Techne. Uh, Parakata theke is the word for deposit. It wasn't just you go into the bank and you open uh, an account and hope it all works out. Uh, that's a word that carries a fiduciary aspect. If you're entrusting your child to someone for education, you say, I'm giving you a parakata theke, a deposit. Take good care of my child. Banking also is characterized by lack of regulation. No license needed, generally no governmental aid. Banks should be a source of strength to the economy, the Athenians felt. Uh, and the bankers uh, took advantage, as you would expect, of a lack of uh, regulation. The Athenian economy divides into two sections, uh, the Afanes Usea and the Fanara Usea. The unseen Afanes, black market, parallel market and the visible market. Since, as you're going to hear shortly, Athenian taxation was extremely high, and for other reasons, such as creditor avoidance, a lot of the Athenian economy was hidden, and the bankers played a major role in that hidden economy. Uh, one other important element is bankers were often, it seems usually, either presently slaves or were formerly slaves. So slaves dominated the banking economy. There's a lot of evidence that banking was a dominant factor in the Athenian economy. So it was possible uh, to uh, have a pretty egalitarian society here. Uh, if your slaves are the ones who are the best paid people, uh, even though juridically they may be enslaved, 
if power has more than one form, and one form can be legal, another can be monetary. Uh, the slaves uh, present, a, uh, at least those in the banking business, a complex uh, world. So let's go back to the banking lessons to be learned. Uh, confidence, and by the way, uh, handout item number two details that crisis in the banks that failed. But items number three, four, and five uh, deal with the great importance of peace these. And I think uh, item number four, which is from Isocrates, uh, really lays out the importance of confidence. Uh, a litigant is complaining it's really difficult to uh, litigate with a banker. The banker was on the other side because banking transactions are done without witnesses. In Athens, in, in the business world, it wasn't written contract, but the presence of witnesses, which generally was critically important. Contracts uh, would be entered into in the Agora, in the Stoas, in the Parthenon, where people would be around. And many, many witnesses were usually brought. But don't forget, the bankers are dealing in the clandestine economy. So it's not surprising that transactions there were done without witnesses. But it was because, as this litigant says, bankers appear to be pistoi, which is the adjectival form of pistis. They appear to be reliable, absolutely trustworthy, diatein techne, because of their profession. So the nature of banking brought forward confidence. Now we come to the modern world. Uh, let me tell you that in 2005, and I'm picking a period before there was any crisis when the bubble worldwide was at its height. Ten-year Greek bonds, Greek government bonds, traded at approximately 3.23%, uh, 323 basis points, as the bankers say, which was <coughs> 10 basis points more than German government bonds for the same period, and about 10 basis points, a tenth of a percent of interest, less than the less reliable U.S. Treasury obligations. So in 2005, the Greek government could borrow at the same rate as the German government, just about the same rate as the American government. It's a process that the psychologists, economic psychologists, call cognitive dissonance. You knew that a Greek government bond, if you were in finance, was not an obligation of something called the European Union. But you thought cognitive dissonance, it's the same the European Union would never let a constituent member of the European Union go down. Pistis. Just as Demosthenes is saying about Formion, who at the time was the greatest banker in Athens, and I think it's handout uh, number three, that you can't convict this man of fraud because the pistis that people have in him makes it possible for him to generate through his bank enormous amounts of money, such as he himself or anyone else, could never acquire, never acquire. It's that leverage factor. You convict him of fraud, you may think you're destroying him, you're destroying Athens. He was acquitted. So one would have expected that if the authorities were familiar with ancient Athens, they would know peace thesis is the most important factor. Now we have a parallel situation in the United States, uh, you're probably all familiar with the uh, government-sponsored organizations, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. They're the real estate organizations in the United States, the only ones that are functioning uh, for the last uh, three or four years. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it was always believed, because they were government-sponsored enterprises and critical to the carrying out of federal government housing policies, the federal government would never let them collapse, and therefore, they were able to borrow, I think it's been reduced somewhat, but at present, they had $10 trillion outstanding. And every certificate that they issued, back in the days when they actually issued paper certificates, said, this is not an obligation of the United States government. And the whole world said, it is an obligation of the U.S. government, because the U.S. government could never let these institutions fail. Well, guess what? They're completely bankrupt. And guess what? The U.S. government, uh, through the end of 2014, it's estimated, will have spent uh, 
over $200 billion sustaining Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But if you stop to think, they have $10 trillion outstanding. And if there were a run on that bank, on those institutions, where would the government possibly find? There isn't enough money. It's the same argument Demosthenes made. Let them go. You might be harming them, uh, but you're really harming uh, the U.S. economy most of all. So the U.S. Econ U.S. has spent hundreds of billions of dollars without any discussion, despite the fact that they said it's not their obligation. It's the element of peace. Thesis. As long as the whole world believes, which the world does believe, that the U.S. government will stand behind those obligations, peace thesis preserved. The Mostanese knew it. Apparently Bernanke knew it. But the European Union went to the opposite extreme. They went out of their way to make it clear that those lazy louts, as I'm calling them half in jest, who won't pay taxes, they don't deserve to be saved. And if they do get saved, it's because they're going to change. And who would ever deal with them? And they, they're dishonest. They, they cook the books. They never should have been. Goodness, how about peace these? Nobody seems to know about that in the uh, uh, high centers of the European Union. However, we now have an Italian leader of the uh, European Central Bank, Mr. Draghi, Signor Draghi, and apparently they study more classics in Italy still, despite its reduced element. He knew immediately peace these. So when he came in, he said, the European Central Bank will do whatever is necessary whatever is necessary, unauthorized statement, uh, the Germans immediately undercut him off, but that restored peace thesis because he can print money. So peace thesis is the most important lesson. Uh, elements of that, I'd say sub-lesson one, and you can look at number six, which I think is the uh, passage dealing with the, uh, uh, with the bankers who tried, with the uh, treasurers who tried to burn down the Acropolis. Very important because the second element is after you preserve peace, these punish the bad guys. And at Athens, they sentenced the treasures of Athena to long prison terms, and they also punished the treasures of the other gods. Uh, in antiquity, people said, well, the treasures of the other gods didn't do anything wrong. And the retort was, that's true, but we have to set an example. Uh, somebody has to be punished. You know how unhappy the public is that after all these years, not a single banker in the United States of any substance has been held criminally responsible. Some people argue, the SEC and others, Department of Justice, well, we can't prove they did anything wrong. But the Athenians knew you preserve peace these and you hold someone responsible. Uh, let's move on to lesson two, that there's a danger inherent uh, in lending. And as I say, Demosthenes 36, uh, uh, rather Isocrates, uh, well, Demosthenes 36.11 deals with the nature of banks and the dangerous uh, revenues that they produce. The uh, Athenians were so aware of this that you needed skill in banking that at Demosthenes uh, 36, 28 to 30, we learn of how you preserved your bank. Bankers generally left their banks to their slaves because in Athens it was very hard to hire somebody, almost impossible to hire someone that violated Athenian values. Uh, Ralph Rosen may remember I spoke about this in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, some years ago. But the value system meant that basically the workers were the downtrodden uh, people who had no choice, women, slaves, and uh, to a large extent, foreigners. But when your bank uh, was going to uh, be, when you wanted your bank to be preserved and you were no longer able to carry on because you were on your deathbed, the general way we're told that bankers handled uh, the situation was to leave their bank to their slaves and they threw in their wives. So we know that the great, uh, that the great uh, Banker Socrates, uh, everybody seems to be named Socrates in Athens, but Akanos, Tropicetes, that famous banker, he left his bank to his uh, major uh, slave, that is his executive vice president, uh, Sakiros, uh, Socles, another great banker, 
did the same thing with Demodemus, and we know that he also went down in that great crash of uh, 376. It even happened in, uh, uh, in Aegina, where the famous banker Strymodorus left his uh, wife uh, to his uh, slave Hermaeus. But when she died, he left his daughter in uh, place thereof. We assume that was a case that uh, the banker lived the one and the wife uh, predeceased him. But that was to make sure that skilled people who had undivided loyalty continued to run the bank. And slaves could become rich. You'll see on handout item number eight that when Demosthenes is boasting of how much he's done for the Athenians, he says he's been right up there with the Plusautat boy, the richest people in Athens. And uh, one of the two people he names, one of the three people he names, is Formion, that giant that I told you about previously. But Formion was born a slave and had only recently gotten freedom. Uh, the uh, greatest student of Athenian naturalization has said that naturalization of Athens wasn't so much a way in which citizenship could be distributed to the deserving as a way in which bankers could buy their way into the Athenian politeia. So slaves uh, did well. And when we talk in terms of the modern world about the need for holding back uh, bonuses, let's wait a while to see what happens. And you know the bankers object strenuously. You're going to hold my bonus for six months? Or if you go into long-term planning, it might be as long as two years. The Athenians understood better. So uh, handout item uh, number nine tells you about four slaves who operated the major bank, Xenon, Euphron, Euphronius, and Callistratus. Uh, they worked for 10 years, paying a huge lease to the bank owners, making payments, not taking bonuses. At the end of the 10 years, they got their reward, Eleutherus, a face on. They were left free. They were uh, uh, free of their, they were manumitted, free of their slave status. That's what I would call holding back the bonus for a reasonable period of time. I'm not sure that a J.P. Morgan, uh, the bankers, would go along with that. Another element was complexity. Number 10 and number 11 items give you an example of some of the complexity of Athenian banking. They knew about credit enhancement. They knew of letters of credit. They knew of other types of uh, sophisticated techniques. But it was all very clear and easily understandable. Uh, probably another good lesson uh, for people dealing with modern crisis. If you can't explain it simply, if you can't keep simple memoranda records that record it, maybe it's not an appropriate business uh, for financial institutions to be involved in. The Athenians were also excellent at knowing and guarding their collateral. That's what you put up as security for a loan. And uh, Demosthenes 32, for example, gives you uh, a real idea of how the Athenians could systematically follow and keep track of what was supposed to be protecting their loan. Those of you who still remember uh, Mr. Governor Corzine and the MF International scandal, where what was it, a billion dollars? Uh, just still hasn't been able to be found. Well, uh, maybe for a hundred billion, uh, it would not have been lost track of. The Athenians weren't dealing in such large numbers, and I have a theory which uh, I haven't been able absolutely to prove, but I believe in, which is that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of wealth in a society and the skill of its bankers. You give me the world's richest society, I will give you the world's poorest bankers. You give me a society that's struggling like the ancient Athenian where you really have to do something to create wealth, the world's best bankers. Uh, taxation. Aristides uh, makes clear, according to the Athapol section, the Constant Aristotle's Constitution, the Athenian section 24, that it should be possible to provide full employment at state expense uh, for every citizen of Athens. Uh, from, uh, he says, from the tribute, because this is in the early 5th century, from the tribute, uh, from taxes, and from other uh, revenues. And the author of the Athapol says, and so it was, the Athenian state provided at that time jobs for 20,000 people. There's no doubt, and uh, I refer you to Gabrielson's book, for example, Remuneration of Slaves, or rather, Remuneration of State Officials, who often were slaves, 
uh, in the fourth century, which uh, was published in 1981, or an article by Rosavik uh, in uh, Greece and Rome in 2011, there were at least 1,500 magisterial positions that we know of in the fifth century. And there were probably lots, one would expect, because our knowledge is so fragmentary that existed beyond that. And beyond these archai, uh, there were apparently innumerable parathroi, uh, dramatics, epogrammatics, uh, assistants, secretaries, assistant secretaries who were employed uh, in Athens. The court system took 2,000 people uh, to uh, each day. The courts uh, were in session 200 days a year. 6,000 people supposedly showed up to try to get these jobs. Full-time employment, maybe not in countries that don't work hard like Germany, but in ancient Greece, if you could combine the 200 days of court session with the 40 days that the uh, demos was in session, all of which was paid between three opals per day, which uh, seems to have been a livable wage, in the opinion of uh, most experts, through nine opals, because they have <coughs> The president's calling for an increase in the minimum wage to be paid by private people. Why should the government not do even better? So uh, government employment was, uh, was really very worthwhile. And then we had the military. Every ship required 200 uh, uh, people and crew. The Athenians had 100 ships. That, that's uh, 20,000 people, 200 ships. 40. So they not only provided uh, employment for the citizens, and although it's much discussed as to how many citizens there were, the highest number that I've ever heard anyone refer to is perhaps 35,000 male citizens over the age of 18, down to as few at times <coughs> as 15,000. So when you have 1,500 archai offices that we know of, and you have to staff the military, and you have to staff all the uh, administrative functions, you probably do have uh, full employment, and if you look at items uh, number 13, item number 13, for example, you find Isocrates making clear just how dependent the Athenian citizen body was uh, on this full employment. They also had welfare, and uh, Lysias 24 deals with what you had to do to get your share of welfare. The Athpol 49.4 so it deals with that. It had to be paid for. And the Athenians, as I indicated, had a citizenry that did not want to pay taxes. That's why you had the Afanes who say it. The people who could not hide their wealth were people who had wealth in real estate. But they weren't happy to uh, make these uh, payments. And you'll see on item uh, uh, number 14, that, again, Xenophon's economic costs, the young man is told he may have great ambitions for the future, but don't worry, whatever you make, with all the liturgies that will be charged, uh, the triarchies and uh, hypotrophia, uh, the courageous obligations, and it's all listed there, and scholars have gathered it all together and shown just how insufferable it was you won't have any money left. And if your business falters, the Athenians will be angry at you as if uh, you had deprived them of something that belonged to them. The Athenians, in short, came up with a perfectly progressive system. A small number <coughs> of the wealthiest people paid all the taxes. The bulk of the population got employment from that. It was easy in the fifth century when they had the silver mines really working when they had tribute. But in the fourth century, we see a rise from perhaps 400 uh, talents a year being collected to as much as 1,500 talents being collected toward the end of the uh, fourth century. So a great deal of money came in in this system, and they depended on tax farming, uh, the private sector. The Athenian state did not try to collect the taxes. If you were a judge responsible for one of these expensive liturgies, you should pay it. And if you didn't pay it, you could bring anybody else in and say that he should pay it. So we have, this was the so-called antidosis in 
we have Isocrates, that fulsome propagandist for Athenian patriotism, uh, writing a speech in which he tries to explain that his students don't pay as much as people think. Uh, he isn't nearly as wealthy as they think he is. Somebody else ought to pay his taxes. Unfortunately, the court did not accept it, and he had to pay it. But the important lesson is that it didn't matter to the Athenian state who paid it, as long as it was paid. And so you could try to hide your assets, but the Antidotes has said that if you came into court and offered to exchange, I could exchange with Brian, who I think really has uh, some clandestine income, uh, as long as I was willing to do that. But in practice, we don't know of any actual exchange. The court simply decided these bycasts who sat uh, in juries of up to 2,501. You may have wondered why the juries were not 12 or 6, 2,501. And of course, there are lots of great explanations as to why that was that deal with Athenian ideology. But I would suggest the need for full employment may be one reason why these uh, uh, courts were so well staffed. And maybe another reason uh, why the Athenians had so many ships and so many people working on taking care of their ships. Uh, lesson four, as I indicated, borrow as little as you can, but when you do borrow, uh, borrow from people uh, that you don't have to repay. So Athena was lending to the Athenians in Pericles' uh, scheme, and he said that they should repay her, but uh, some of us may think that if they did not, perhaps Athena's uh, collection mechanisms were no more effective than uh, some of the modern banks' uh, collect, uh, collection efforts. Uh, the Athenians had a uh, method of borrowing called the epidosis. It was a voluntary loan. But of course, it was the kind of voluntary loan uh, that the government extracted from you without any indication of how it planned to repay it. Uh, the pro ace for all was another example. If the government needed the money before it could get together, the ace for all, which was a special uh, call on citizens of wealth to uh, make even greater payments, they called on the 300 wealthiest people to make advance payments. And then it was up to them uh, to collect from the people who were supposed to make the payment. And we know in, from Demosthenes 50, that somebody who was called on for pro, for pro ace for all was also out commanding a ship because he was meeting the triarchy in Athens. You had not only to pay for the ship, but you had the right to command it. Not everyone did, but this particular person did. He said by the time he got back, anybody who had money had already been collected on uh, by one of the other people, and he only found people who were opera, who had no possibility of making repayment. We find finally that Lycurgus, and this is handout sheet item number 19, was supposedly able to raise the amazing amount as an intermediary of 650 talents on Athens' behalf in 338.7. And you'll find that the reason he was able to do this, supposedly, was because he had the highest reputation for pistos, the element of pistis. So we come back at the end of all these lessons the fact that I think the key element in Athenian finance, key element in American finance, but not an element that the Europeans have paid proper attention to, is this element of peacenics. Thank you very much. I've covered American, European, <laughs> Athenian economy and society, and I hope I didn't take too much time. Yeah, wow. I don't think I've ever heard such a bravura performance. <laughs> you were moving back and forth from ancient to modern worlds with no hesitation whatsoever, quoting from the passages in the original Greek from memory, and giving a more compelling explanation of the current global economic situation, more compelling than any politician I've ever heard. So now you with, know why I love this man. <laughs> with that, let me open the floor to questions. Regular. So it begs the question, did they separate investment from lending banks? Uh, no. The, uh, the concept was the paracontha theke had to be repaid. <coughs> absolute obligation of repayment. But the banker had an absolute right to do with it as he wanted. Now, for example, we assume uh, that a deposit is 
is cash in today's banks. But remember, this is a deposit, so you could deposit items of uh, value, works of art, silverware. And we're told in Demosthenes 49 of one fellow <coughs> who deposited with a bank of Posseum expensive uh, silverware. And he went out on a, out on a business uh, call. And you couldn't fly back the same day. When he came back two or three months later, uh, he wanted his silverware back. But of course, the bank had been lending out the silverware because it's a deposit. They have an absolute right. Unfortunately, they got back inferior silverware. And that was the, one of the bases of the litigation that's handled in the Boston these 49, because the bank tried to tender the cash equivalent. But the depositor wanted back what he deposited. So they didn't separate investment banking from commercial banking. The banker had absolute right. Dangerous business. Yes, they did. I've, I've also often thought of various aspects of the Athenian uh, method as something that could be well imitated today. But as you mentioned, many of their banks failed too. In the, uh, when we look at the, at the bottom line, were they more successful than we are? Oh, I, I'm dealing with the epistemological aspects <laughs> here because, as you know, we can teach, right, David? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's true in Israel too. We can teach, but do the students learn? So the Athenians have lessons to teach, but probably they did not learn them any better than we have. <laughs> By the way, David's the author of a preeminent book on money, and uh, he could well get up here and not only deal with America and, uh, Greek, and ancient Greece, but also with the Bible and uh, the Middle East. But for that, you need an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. Could you paint a hypothetical portrait of what you think Greece would look like today if there never had been a European Union? I, uh, this is just a, my own personal opinion. You see, I, I've spent a lot of time, of course, in Greece. I was a student at the American School of Classical Studies and, and have really been around archaeology uh, quite a bit. But I used to come back from Greece, whose people I love and whose culture, like so many of us, just adore modern culture and have had such good times there. I would just tell my friends about some of the experiences I had. And I was taken aback once when somebody said, you must really hate these people. Uh, you must despise them. Because it was all this using brain power to get more, each individual getting more than his share, which I really found amusing even, even when they took advantage of me. But uh, after that, I didn't talk too much about it because I certainly didn't want to be negative. But later, in recent years, as people have read in the newspapers and elsewhere about what goes on in modern Greece, people said, we always thought you were given to hyperbole, but in fact, you were underestimating the chicanery <laughs> of these people. The answer is, Greece is a poor country, as Plato said. Maybe in his, he says, in antiquity, his antiquity, Greece was a wealthy land with uh, well watered and trees and so forth. But by the fourth century BCE, it was already impoverished. Greece doesn't have natural resources, doesn't have factories, it has tourism, it does that, in my opinion, poorly compared to compare Athens and its hotels to what you find in that other ancient Greek city that they now call Istanbul, based in Pauline. Uh, it's a poor country, but a clever one, and people who are very skilled. Coming into the European Union, this cognitive cognitive dissonance meant you could borrow unlimited amounts of money. And as you know, the Greeks did that. In addition to which, uh, there was the ability to get grants. The Europeans built a subway system. They paid for the Olympic Games. Between these two combinations, Greece became a very wealthy country. But one of my Greek friends told me recently, shame on us. We think we're so smart. We really thought we were a rich country. The truth is, we were just very skillful at extracting money from the world and from the European Union. So I think uh, the Greece that some of us, the elderly, knew in the 1960s, a poor country before the so-called Greek miracle, is probably what uh, Greece would have remained if it weren't. It's not only the European Union, but this view that modern developing countries can be lent to. Here's an item uh, we now find that everyone turned to the great sovereign wealth funds from Oman and Abu Dhabi. <coughs> uh, 
and they came and the latest scandal, of course, I think is uh, Barclays Bank, where when Barclays Bank needed hundreds of millions of pounds of fresh cash infusion, they turned to the appropriate sovereign wealth fund for the Middle East. They didn't tell them that Barclays was lending them the money that they were putting in. So now, peace needs is important. The Middle Eastern countries have had unlimited confidence, but is their great prosperity built on that peace piece, or is it actually built on wealth? Well, I think my Greek friends would say, well, they actually do have oil, and we don't yet. So I think Greece would be a poor country, and what, what my friends are suffering through uh, is not abnormality, but probably a return to a reversion to normality. Yes, ma'am. It's an excellent point. Uh, this presentation probably should have been over a four-day period, sort of like the Wagner cycle at the end. Uh, but one of the things that I have said on other occasions is modern uh, Greek banks, in my opinion, were very skillful. Uh, I happen personally to uh, be uh, somewhat friendly with Mr. Kostopoulos, the elder, uh, whose family has run Tropas of Pistios, which originated in uh, Kalamata back in 1923, <coughs> I think. When they changed the name to Alpha Bank, I thought, this is not good, uh, because they're getting with the European aspects. But in fact, it's, it's a bank that's been run by the Kostopoulos family for decades and decades, for a hundred years, really, the better part of a hundred years. And they didn't want to buy Greek government bonds. They were a private bank. The pressure that was put on them to support the Greek government was overwhelming. And in the end, they only bought half of what the National Bank of Greece, FBK, uh, bought. But that was a government-controlled bank. Uh, so obviously, there was a total absence of uh, integrity, I would say, rather than peace uh, in terms of what was forced on the uh, Greek banks. Uh, the Athenian banks in antiquity uh, were pretty clever, so uh, they were not regulated. Uh, they seem to have been able to avoid uh, governmental pressure in most ways. But that's a whole uh, story in and of itself in each country. It's a different aspect, but it is a shameful uh, story. And of course, I think a lot of people understand that the average Greek says, well, wait a second, they borrowed all these trillions of euros, and my, my life did not get better. But in my opinion, as I was answering Brian, I think they're wrong because their life would have been so miserable if this had not gone on. And the present misery they're going through is typical. I sat next to the uh, Greek consul general in New York at a dinner recently, and uh, somebody said to him, uh, gee, you've, you've taken these cuts. And I wasn't sure that they really did cut uh, anything, in fact. But he said, yeah, you know, our salaries have been cut 30 or 40 percent. I don't know how we're going to survive. But I reminded him that when I was a youth, service in the Greek uh, foreign service was unpaid, essentially unpaid. You had to get approval from the uh, ministry before you married. The reason being that unless you married into a wealthy family, you could not continue your foreign ministry career because they didn't pay anything. And he said, yeah, that was true, but it changed a lot. The same thing with uh, professors. They were expected essentially unpaid to get positions with company boards or to come from wealthy families. So all of the changes in Greece, which of course are good for the people, really were a result of this governmental borrowing and uh, all the other excessive practices. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.